It is a great privilege to talk to the Nixon Foundation on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the summit in Beijing that occurred in the Nixon administration and through its efforts. <clears throat> Let me talk to you about the basic strategic thinking of the Nixon administration. We came into office with the war in Vietnam that had been going on for with American participation for five years, with the Soviet Union just having occupied the country of Czechoslovakia in Europe, and with a permanent crisis with China, with which there had been no communications for 25 years. The essence of the Nixon policy was not to deal with any one problem on a tactical level, but to see whether they could be linked together in such a way that the solutions reinforced each other and that the challenges could be met with superior force. And this is why the comments that are sometimes made about the Nixon administration, that they were too tough, and others that they were too conciliatory, are in a way both partially true, because the effort was to combine both strengths and conciliation in the same policy in order to get a world order in which the American people could feel secure, the people of the world would be convinced that the United States was a solution to crisis and not the cause of crisis, and in which a new world order could be created. So, from the beginning, we pursued this dual policy. I will now make a few remarks about the China segment of it. When Nixon came into office, there had been no significant communications between China and the United States for 25 years. China was going through what was called the Cultural Revolution, which altered their whole leadership structure. And we had domestic issues over Vietnam. Nevertheless, Nixon ordered a major effort to contact the Chinese. That was not very easy because they had no diplomats abroad due to the Cultural Revolution, except in Egypt. So <clears throat> Nixon and I approached people at various levels of various countries. But the breakthrough came when Nixon, on a visit to Pakistan, told the Pakistan president that he wanted contact with the Chinese at a high level and received a letter several weeks later directly from Zhou Enlai that the Chinese appreciated being approached by a head, from a head, through a head of government. 
these communications gives them the sensitivity of the subject were delivered by hand on both sides through a, a messenger from supplied by the Pakistan government. After nearly a year of exchanges through this complicated method, a visit was arranged by me to Beijing. We, President Nixon and I discussed at length what our message should be. And uh, we agreed on an approach. And while I was traveling to China, which most, which of course nobody knew, Nixon gave a speech in Kansas City that explained his approach to the international system and mentioned a significant role for China in it. So the Chinese had read that speech when I arrived, by the time I arrived. And so the discussions that I had with Premier Zhou and Lai did not have to spend any time on this topic. We took this topic for granted in discussing the nature of a world in which China and the United States might work in parallel or even cooperatively. And this led to an invitation to Nixon to come to China to continue and elaborate these discussions. Now, we had a principle that Nixon would not meet at heads of state unless he knew roughly what the outcome of the conversation would be. And that was based on the conviction that if leaders at that level meet and do not achieve an outcome or differ about the outcome, that it is very difficult after that to appeal to any other group because that is already the highest level. So Nixon agreed that there should be, and insisted that there should be a preliminary meeting, again between Cho and Lai and me, in which we would outline the nature of the communique that would appear. And the result was a very unusual communique, which stated that the disagreements between the two sides in very explicit language, but that created a backdrop to a number of agreements which were then all the more significant about the nature of the world order in which the Chinese and we renounced attempts for domination uh, and about Taiwan in a complicated formula, the outcome was that we <clears throat> said we were not challenging the one China concept. But on the other side, the Chinese had stated in the conversations with the president that they could wait a long time for a final resolution, which we stated needed to be peaceful. 
So it is in this mountain that the current discussions and tensions over Taiwan should be seen. And it is a mountain that should not be transgressed without evoking sharp counter reactions. So for out of this Shanghai communique grew decades of cooperation with China. In recent, in the two recent administrations, tensions have developed. They are partly due to the fact that the Chinese economy developed at a level and at a number that created capacities in the military field that nobody could anticipate or did anticipate 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So, and it is therefore necessary to take a look at this relationship under present circumstances. And the Nixon principles, in my view, remain valid. First, it is important to remember that at the end of Nixon's first term, the various problems I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, the problems with Russia, the Vietnam War, and the challenge of China, all came to a head simultaneously due to the, uh, a policy of linkage that Nixon established in the first weeks in office. There were summits in Beijing and in Moscow. There was a peace agreement with Vietnam and there was a relationship with China that achieved a major purpose in the Cold War. And the purpose was to prevent Russia from concentrating all its forces against Europe, as in many respects it is doing today in different circumstances. But in those days, uh, our instructions to the State Department and to the White House staff were, when you make a decision that involves both China and Russia, place yourself so that you are closer to both than they are to each other. And that policy has been maintained by several administrations for many decades. It's a policy that is in jeopardy today. But at this moment, it is not my intention to make any partisan comment. My intention is to show that a president could come into office, recognize the issues, assign a strategy to them, and come up with concurrent conclusions uh, simultaneously, and the picture of a world that was both secure and at peace. That, in my view, it's the Nixon legacy, and it is one that should be a basic consideration for any American leader dealing with the nature of the world which we are facing.
So thank you very much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity.